The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, my name is Buzz Leonard. Uh, I'm Carter. I'm Brianna. And Rosser's not here right now, and our team lead is uh, Ken. Um, and we're uh, working on OJ Sealer um, for a community in Nicaragua. Uh, we were partnered with uh, the NGO ASO Phoenix, uh, which is uh, a organization that does uh, rural sustainable development projects um, with multiple communities uh, in Nicaragua. And they do projects such that promote clean water, uh, electricity, income generation, and also educational projects that uh, help the community be healthy. Uh, so our project uh, centers around the community El Roblar that we visited while we were down there. And they have a large orange harvest crop that they get, and there's no market for the oranges. Um, during the harvest season because everybody's harvesting oranges. So the idea is to create a way for them to sell the oranges or a product from the oranges in the off season to generate income. And they were introduced a pasteurization process to preserve uh, the orange juice by uh, Oso Phoenix and through a, the University of Managua. So that, that process is in place and we are trying to develop a way for them to seal a plastic bag uh, in order to preserve the juice. And this is actually stemming off of a project that was started during last year's D-Lab Energy class. Um, and you see that project pictured at the bottom here. And uh, our, our specifications that we want to achieve with our project is to have it, the device be able to run off 120 volts of AC current. And, uh, while, and the seal should be done while removing the air from the bag so there's no air in the bag um, to prevent spoiling of the juice. Um, after it's sealed uh, before it's sold uh, and we also want to create and maintain the uh, durable user-friendly interface that was began last year's with last year's project um, so this is a bigger picture of last year's project and it sealed the bags nicely and all but there's uh, several areas that we feel need improving on before it can actually really be used uh, the first one is the power supply uh, between last year and this year, the community that we're working in um, got rid of all their 12 volt batteries like that because they got a micro hydro grid and so now they're running on 120 AC so we need to make it actually be able to run on the power that they have. Um, I mentioned removing all the air from the bags. The preservation process isn't very strong so it's a key part of making sure the orange juice stays good. Um, the wide, flat surface that they're sealing on here makes it very, very difficult to do that. Um, so we wanted to improve that as well. Um, and then when we talk about um, comfort in using it, um, the light that indicated whether something is hot or not was right about here. And you would use it from the other side. It was very difficult to see. Um, there's a latch that's really difficult to open. Um, and trying to get the bags to get all the air out because of the wide flat surface was also very difficult. And um, the control, the timing circuit there, that they, they used an out-of-the-box timing circuit, um, mainly I think because of limited time, um, that cost $26, so we're also designing a simplified timing circuit built out of just components that is only going to be a couple dollars. So we wanted to first go into um, experimentation and see what needed to be done to, uh, I guess, get a good seal on a bag. Um, so we first started off with what type of plastic do we need? Uh, we basically tested, uh, we got some plastic from uh, Nicaragua and we brought it back and it turned out to be uh, 25 thousandths of an inch. Um, so we're testing with 25 thousandths of an inch and 45 thousandths of an inch, uh, that because um, there's various plastics there, and so we wanted to uh, test with multiple types of plastic to uh, accommodate that. 
Um, in addition to that, we wanted to see what temperature was needed to fully seal plastic. So we used the uh, standard impulse or the uh, industry um, standard, which is the impulse sealer, to seal a bag. And we used a thermocouple to determine the temperature. We got a temperature of uh, about 195 Celsius, and you can see it uh, gets a good seal like this. Let me pass this around if you want. Um, the water should be orange juice, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So we got um, 195 Celsius. That's the temperature we need to hit. Um, and in addition to the temperature, uh, another factor is pressure. How much force do you need to put down on a nichrome wire to get a good seal? So we used a for uh, force plate sensor and a push down on it. Um, we got about 56 newtons, which uh, translates to about 169 kilopascals on the nichrome wire. Um, and you can see over here with, if you don't apply enough pressure, you get a um, sort of like a perforated uh, line where there's seals like, uh, there's a lot of gaps in between the seals. So this is not a good seal because there wasn't enough pressure, although the time was perfect. Um, with this, with a six kilogram weight, you got a good solid seal um, on, the, on the bag. Everything looks good, uh, water did not leak, and that is ideal. Uh, in terms of timing, we also want to make sure you apply the right amount of time or else it melts, the plastic will melt. Uh, so what we did was we had a standard weight, we applied it to um, our rig and tested uh, with a constant voltage, different timing. Um, so we ran, we ran the, the device for a certain amount of time and then increased it slowly. So you can see as you increase more time, this, was enough, this wasn't enough uh, pressure because it's, you see the dimples, but you can see over time that it's a very small seal to one that's uh, melted. And so with various um, weights and various voltages and varying the time, we got um, figured out exactly what we need. Um, so in terms of power and voltage, I'll pass it off to Brianna. Um, so before I get into our different tests of power and voltage, you might notice that it says like 5 volts, 10 volts, 12 volts, but we were talking about 120 volts AC. Um, this is because we have decided that the best way to run something off the wall power is actually just to buy an adapter and plug it in and convert it to 12 volts DC. Um, running something off the wall makes it very difficult to have our timing circuit work. We'll probably have to um, rectify that into DC anyway. Um, the 120 volts with our nichrome that's like a 4 ohm resistor would have to add either more resistors that would do nothing for the heating and be expensive because they'd have to be big power resistors, um, or lots more nichrome wire, which would again be expensive. Um, if we built our own adapter, the price came out to just about the same as what 12 volt, 3, 4 amp adapters are selling for, and it would be more complicated and harder to replace and such. So um, it turns out that the best solution to running it off the wall is just to buy an adapter and run it off the 12 volt set anyways. Um, so we did tests with power and voltage, or power controlled by what voltage we were putting across a resistor. and um, the time that we left it on for. Um, these are just a couple samples there. You can see at five volts, even when we were doing it for a minute, we didn't get hot enough to melt the bag at all. I know the pictures aren't really great, but um, bear with us. At 10 volts, we had a good seal in just 20 seconds. And at 12 volts, um, by the time it was 14 seconds, we were already sealing it too much. So this was giving us a good idea of our trade-offs between how much power we're using, what range of powers and times we can use. Um, I think we did get a good seal of the 12 volts at about like eight or 10 seconds, um, but didn't really have a at all visible picture of that to show you. Um, so um, that was the ex er experimentation that we did, and we wanted to um, use this result into our design. So when we designed our product, we wanted to take two things into mind, functionality and usability. Um, the thing about functionality is we want the users to be uh, looking down on the product so they can use it uh, on a table and they also want a, um, a nice latch system. Um, so as you can see over here we have uh, an angled product um, and since it's angled you can look down on it, use it easily. Um, I should be taller, but yeah. Um, and with this angled uh, plane you can have the bag hanging down as such so that the liquid will be um, in the bag and that you can get a good airtight seal here. Um, and then another bonus is that the excess juice that you, we're sealing through juice in order to get an airtight seal. Um, 
the extra juice you can just let run off after you make this seal. And you can have a pot sitting right here to catch the excess juice. Um, so that's another, and the spr there are springs in this arm um, that allow you, once, you have, once we have a latch system, that will uh, keep the same force for every seal. Uh, so you'll know that you have enough force and that given the timing circuit, it'll run for the same amount of time so the seals will all be the same. Um, and then we're on the latch system. Um, the springs also provide some give uh, that will allow this to be compressed a little bit more than um, the, the necessary force for a seal. So we can just have a simple rotating um, thing out of uh, sheet metal, um, something that's readily available in Nicaragua. Um, and then you can slide it over uh, like the picture and then when you want it off you can press down, slide it back off and you'll be ready to go. So we have some uh, future things that we need to uh, work on. Um, one thing would be combining the ergonomics, uh, the usability of this product in addition to the functionality. Um, we were doing a sample test on a basically just two pieces of wood testing, uh, putting weight on top, and so we need to add a nichrome wire onto the uh, base of this so that we can actually seal bags with this design. Um, in addition to that, we need to uh, finalize the circuitry and d uh, design a housing device for the electronics that we would be placing on the side. Um, in addition to that, once we have this completed, uh, basically just get users to test it, make sure it's um, intuitive, easy to use, and a great product overall. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Ken, Amy, Amit, D-Lab overall, um, and our community partner, also Phoenix. Uh, are there any questions? So, you're sealing through juice right now, are you testing that by sealing through water? Yes. Can you seal through pulp? That's a good question. We have yet to test that. Okay. Probably time to buy some lunch juice. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I would buy the like the super extra pulpy the, version, and then throw some like sticks and rocks into it. Yeah. Measure. And and at one point it would be worth it to test like actually squeeze your own juice because <laughs> it's not that hard to make a bit. Um, we want it to be able to, I guess, be easily used by one person, ideally. So if they having, you want, you, we're not sure that this, um, like there could be cases if they're filling like liter bags or two liter bags of juice, if they're selling it to restaurants for um, kind of like wholesale, like to restaurants, this force pressing down might not be enough to hold the bag. So they might need to be holding the bag, pressing a button. So you want you want to be able to do one thing at a time with your free hand. In addition to that, you also want to have a constant force uh, for each seal. So there can be variable forces if you like push harder or less than each time. Where I'm gonna say that it's also it might be easy for these guys to remember like how much force they didn't always put enough force on it. But when I when I was doing some tests, I wasn't always getting enough force on there. And the people who are doing this are women and girls, so. It's um, like even like nine, ten, twelve-year-old girls being able to latch it down prevents from having to hold all the pressure there all the time. Is the current device being used? Or is it here? It's or half of the device. For that? It's the last one. No, this is a new one. We left the uh, last year's model in Nicaragua with House of Phoenix. Is it being used? And it, it works off the twelve-volt battery. I'm not sure if it's being used. Um, in another community. We delivered it uh, last month. It's last not year. orange juice season at the moment, so exactly. Right now it's not being used. I don't know whether they will take it out to the community to use it when it becomes orange. Last season. year's project also did not have the specification to remove the air, so using that while removing the air is also more so difficult. The feedback that you have is based on is from the field or from your own? Operation? From the field, from our spring break trip down to Nicaragua and fact finding there with in El Roblar. With, 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 with that with, with, yeah. yeah. Do you have any, can you show pictures of that testing? Yeah, we we have pictures. Sure. Sure. No, no, thank you.
you might want to think about is, is since you're trying to create sort of at least notionally sterile stuff, um, you might want to start, it might be time to start thinking about segregating this thing into the stuff you have to keep clean and the stuff you don't have to keep clean. It's like having to reach over with your, you know, your s sterile hand that's in all the juice and in all the stuff you're trying to reclaim and like reach over and hit the button on the top of the timer is going to become a drag if that, like that button somehow has to stay clean. Like if you can give them things like foot pedals and elbow switches and, you know, stuff so that just to think about the process and like how you're going to keep the clean stuff clean and, and not and sort of minimize the amount of stuff you actually have to keep sterile to make it make the process. Probably missed it, but um, what is the price point between the ARG and the device that are available? There aren't devices that use low power like this. Yeah. I'm not sure what the price point for the impulse sealer is, but Running it off batteries or the micro hydro grid, you can't use that. It, it uses more power than there, there's a limit to the amount of power that any like, device they've run off the micro hydro grid that Also Phoenix has installed um, is allowed to draw. So um, Also Phoenix uh, doesn't allow the use of irons or like hair dryers or hair straighteners or anything that's heavy power intensive like that. Um, when we compare what we have to the design that was made last year, I think were probably about $10 less, which not if you not include a battery, I think that makes us around $40 instead of around $50, um, which did so it's not No, it, 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 instead of sealing, um, our slide about the commercial one is so it used uh, some large amount of power for about half a second. This will use um, like 30 watts for more like 10 seconds. So these are our um, the photos working in the field in uh, the house we stayed in El Roblar. Uh, a group of about eight to, eight to 10 of the women of the town came and uh, we gave a demonstration of how it works. Roll through, so this is, we found out that there were no 12 volt batteries, so we strung up a bunch of AA and AAA batteries just to be able to do the demonstration. So that we got like somewhere between like six and ten bags yeah. of that <laughs> for the batteries. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the process. Then they they actually got to seal a few bags um, themselves. Let me know if you have any questions as we're going through. Do you have any sense about like a minimally acceptable amount of air in this thing? We heard from the community partners that they didn't want any air. Um, okay, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> uh, in terms of like room for air, we're we're not sure. Um, we don't know. Because I wonder if there's a correlation between like the size of that bar that it's hanging off of and how much air. Presumably, if you make a really sharp edge, and so ideally we're gonna have the nacre wire close as close to the edge as possible to get it as clean a seal as possible. Um, because the more, the further it, the further in it is, the more overlap there is. So there's gonna be potentially more air. Because um, it's easier to get a like clamp it like this versus on top. But and that's actually the last. Well, no. Yeah. Try to run it off solar as well, but this is getting away from the presentation more. So, how many bags have you guys sealed over the course of the semester? Oh, including the testing, where we were just doing. Five gallons worth of orange juice, or five gallons worth of water, and hundred bags. We usually just. Have a real process, or is it just a single one-off? One-off every now and then. Uh, we've been sealing bags um, the size of at least. So, but uh, that was with our kind of works like model. So we haven't combined the sealer with this ergonomic um, application of it yet to have something that. Are those bags, the individual bags, locally available, or do you get it in a long tube? They get it in a long tube, okay. and we have 
about six feet of that tube here. Yeah, seal, 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 and then just cut. cut. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we have the long tube, and that's for like the individual size sermons. We aren't sure that that would always be what they would get, especially if they're like one or two liter bags. So we wanted something. I think we were trying to go a little more flexible rather than specifically for that would only be an advantage with the long tube. Right. You can still use that process. Right. Yeah. Or. sort of as a continuous process so you've only got like a half a bag's worth of stuff supported above no matter what size the bag is and then you keep filling it you know once you've made that last seal then it makes the support problems a little bit easier it might be too late to start thinking about that does the once the orange juice is sealed does it need refrigeration no no they haven't as long as there's no air pasteurization process it comes before is there a standard for the size of bubble that can, be, that can remain, or does it have to be absolutely no air? Um, as Steve asked, we were not sure. <laughs> yeah. You guys were going to look into that. Did you make any progress there? Um, I think I think the most answer they, we got they was that yes, no the air, air needs to be removed. There needs to be no air. And whether that's a like overstating the um, requirement or actually there really actually needs to be no air, that's where we're unsure, I think. So we're making our goal be there is actually no air. Have you started testing to see if you can actually successfully seal with zero air or zero noticeable air? I think we did one with our um, flat one that wasn't even that we had no air in. Um, yeah. How, how crazy is their pasteurization process? Yeah. Like throw <laughs> it in a pot, boil it for 10 minutes, and then put it in the bag? Some, Some more citric acid. Citric acid, citric acid. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'll bet it depends a lot more on keeping the clean room clean than on how much air is in the bag. Because there's air in a bottle of sunny delay. There's air at the top of, you know, like, there's air at the top of the bag of the jar of pickles. There's, you know, it's, if it's pasteurized and it's highly acid, then you're trying to, you know, what's left that you're trying to, to get rid of with the botulism, but air doesn't help that. I don't know. It, it, it's a, yeah, I, I'm trying to find well, the it, it'd be Well, it'd be good to both be able to answer that and also know, like, even if you have the answer that air is okay, if they are convinced that air is not okay, that may be a knockout blow. And so practicing to make sure the ergonomics and whatever your process are set up such that you can actually ensure that most of the time you're getting a bag with no air visible, I think would be good to, to practice that a bunch. would like that. Um, this was an earlier model. We've got it um, covered in plastic. Um, probably when the way we're going to go. Last year's was painted or lacquered or both. Yeah. Um, so it would definitely be some kind of more wiped downable surface. wood is going wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry over and over and over again. But if you're going to run it all day long wet, it's not the end of the world. You know, wooden cutting boards are clean, cleanable. You just might not want to make it out of something, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to make the surfaces flat so you can clean them. So a really soft pine will nick and, and harder stuff, but harder wood would probably be okay. 
think one of their main concerns also was capturing the overflow juice. Yeah. In that case, you want a very sterile surface, and or as clean as you can get. And if you have an extra eight inches off your roll of plastic or six inches off your roll of plastic that you can just wrap that bottom portion with, that mm -hmm. is like kind of your runoff shape. Then you don't actually have to worry about uh, cleaning your wood as mm -hmm. as much as you would have. It's also nice for the overflow to like soak into the device rather than being reclaimed. the first little bit was something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks you guys. Hi, uh, we're the charcoal group. Um, I'm Vivian. I'm Jessica. And I'm Kurt. Um, and our project mentors are Amelia, raise your hand. <laughs> and Steve over there. Okay. Um, so first oh Okay. Our main motive. Sorry. Okay. Our main motivation <laughs> for our project um, stems from the work we did with a Nicaraguan-based NGO called Group of Phoenix, and more specifically, we worked with a cooperative called the Mujeres Solares, which is the Solar Women. Um, basically, we introduced um, the idea of D Labs uh, agro waste charcoal, and for those of you aren't familiar with it. It's basically a process of making charcoal um, out of agro waste or biomass instead of wood. So, you know, you reduce deforestation and um, it burns a lot cleaner. Um, we really wanted to um, improve this process so that the women would feel more comfortable integrating this into their everyday lives or possibly using this as a business activity for them. Um, right now, there is a general discomfort with the process and Jess can talk to you a little bit more about those specifics. So what was really unique to our group was that we had the language um, to get the direct feedback from the women. So we didn't have to go through a third person. Instead, you know, I was able to interpret exactly what they were saying. And you hi I see, I've highlighted here that the biggest issue for them today is still covering the barrel because they cannot bathe afterwards after dealing with so much heat of the barrel. Um, they say that the heat is too intensive for them and then they you know, would bathe with cold water and then they would get sick afterwards. So that's the biggest gap for them right now. Even when we um, discussed uh, the different project ideas that we had uh, to, to make the charcoal process better, they still brought us back to, we really want you to work on the barrel, um, so, do something so that it doesn't feel so high. Um, so we're going to show you a video of um, the oh, women yeah. doing a charcoal burn. Well, I can't fast forward, but this is the third charcoal burn that the women are doing by themselves. We trained them, and then we had them do the first two by themselves. They were successful. This is the third one, and you can see that even in the third trial, there's still some <laughs> uncoordination um, in the barrel ceiling. This is a current design where the barrel sits on top of the bricks, and you have to tilt and kick, and sometimes kick too much. And so what we can see here are the main points, the main pain points of the process, which are, I'll stop that right now, which are the heat intensity of the process, which is what they've identified, and of course the safety issue. And we realize that we need to address these two concerns while still meeting the same quality of a charcoal burn. Great, so in order to um, meet these criteria that Jess just highlighted, um, our design submerges the uh, bricks on which the barrel sits into the ground and um, so basically what we've done here I can show you on our model here this is uh, one of the uh, ideas of the charcoal bird is that it's uh, it uses commonly available materials like a oil drum so I've used a natty ice um, can here too in the same spirit um, and the uh, so instead of sitting on top of the ground it now sits on bricks that are submerged into holes. And uh, so the design is pretty simple. There is a dugout hole. There are six bricks that line three channels, which allow for airflow. In this space right here, the, um, the ground and the barrel form a seal. So the, uh, the barrel does not move once it's been um, lit on fire. And 
we've uh, calculated the airflow so that uh, there is sufficient airflow through those channels uh, into the holes that are at the bottom of the barrel so that um, the so that the while it's burning there's enough air and uh, so to work on sealing these channels we have um, we've come up with these uh, metal plates right here so essentially this is just uh, sheet metal and it has these uh, handles on top we call them and they can be pushed in underneath the uh, uh, over rather the three channels to seal them and just with a little bit of sand it forms a seal around the whole barrel um, so eliminates the need for tilting the barrel kicking it kicking out the bricks and all of that and we experimented with a number of uh, shapes here at the top so this is a semicircular we also have like triangular shapes and then different various types of handles which Jessica will go into um, in a second so an overview of the benefits of this design compared to the existing, um, the existing portion of the process that we're trying to fit are first that it minimizes the heat exposure because the uh, the flaming barrel is now in the ground and there's no space for the there, there's minimized space for this heat to come out. The second is that uh, one person can seal the. Um, the barrel rather than needing to and we can show a video of that right now although I'm yeah, yeah. you uh, so this is the entire process uh, we and I'll talk through this um, third is that we can, you can still light the barrel through the channels and um, the barrel doesn't move once it's on fire and flaming so um, as you can see, all Jessica is doing here is just pushing the, uh, the, the plates in at a safe distance and um, with minimal exposure to heat, basically. Um, and so, from our experiment, we were able to conclude um, what designs of sheet and handles were better equipped to meet our project attributes. We wanted to be able to steer the sheet and the better design for that was the semicircular plate. Um, in terms of maneuvering and being precise about where the sheet was going, the lipped handle, which is this one right here, allowed for the wood to come in and kind of fit right there, um, just enough to be able to, to maneuver the sheet into where we wanted it. Uh, the lifting potential of the lift handle allowed us to sort of kick the sheet up a little bit if it ever got stuck right before the brick. Um, and the three sheets worked equally as well um, to diminish the heat exposure and to uh, lessen the time that it took to seal the barrel. <laughs> now stepping back for a second, the sheet metal is only one of three uh, sealing, barrel sealing alternatives that we're considering right now. The other two are inserting a brick into the channel of the dugout and covering the rest with sand. And the third is even simpler than that, just shoveling in or pouring in sand into the three holes. Um, and of course on the left we have different sort of design excuse me, specifications that we want this to meet because it's part of the process that before was most heat intensive. Um, you'll see there's an even spread right now of all the three uh, designs. For example, the sheet metal is best in, in diminishing or in lessening the time that it takes to seal, but the sand could be done from farthest away if you just sort of take the sand and throw it into the barrel, throw it in along the side. But this is due to the metrics of the attributes, right? For example, the labor intensity. We consider that it's easier to seal the hole, but you do have to spend some time finding the sheet metal, which is readily available in Nicaragua, but you still have to make and manufacture the sheet, um, the sheet metal with the handles. Only once, though. So in our experiment, we concluded that um, our dugout was successful in um, addressing the need to reduce heat exposure. Um, it channels all the heat down into the dugout instead of um, at the people working on it. Um, we also were able to de decrease a safety risk of the tip and kick method. Um, our sheet metal seals were also successful in um, creating a seal and um, resulting in a quality burn. We did get some really good carbonized material out of this burn, um, but there are definitely still improvements to be made. Um, 
we can still work on the maneuverability and handling of these seals with the handles. And um, we can also work on adding a little more distance between the person and the barrel. And so we're at our next steps, um, which are going to be to send the documented process of our new barrel design or charcoal making design to the women. And they're going to make a charcoal burn early next week. We're going to phone call them and talk to them directly. I'll talk to them directly and get their feedback on what the heat experience was and see how they've um, how they can explain that and whether it's better or worse. Um, and finally, we're going to continue to look at improving the sheet metal design um, and seeing how we can manufacture it easier or how we can just get it um, a better design so we can man maneuver it better. And finally, of course, we're here to incorporate your input. So, questions? Questions? Yes, Benji. Have you been able to talk to them about the three different options of how to seal the holes? Like, in terms of, like, would you rather make a plate or would you rather just like fill in the dirt? So no, the answer is no. Um, not about those three specific designs, but um, in our conversations with Lindsay, which is sort of their project coordinator or- Our liaison. Our liaison with the community. Um, she says that she continues to say that the, the heat of it is the biggest exposure. So rather than have them do the test trials and all the experimentation of like, which feels best or taking all this data that we've been taking, we try to get the data first and then submit our conclusive, you know, recommendation to them, and then that's what they're going to do this week. How are you actually going to communicate to them your idea? Do you need to describe the whole of the as well? And have a whole yeah, right now, um, when you train a community to make a charcoal burn, there's a nifty document with diagrams that D-Lab has produced um, that tells them, you know, how to make the holes or how to set up the bricks and all the process. And so we're going to do that. They've already been trained with that and they have that document. We train them over spring break. And so we're just going to sort of an addendum, an appendix to what the new process should be and how they should dig the hole and all that so they can do their charcoal burn next week. And we have all the specifications for the hole um, based on like airflow, right? So that how we can send them. Be. Exactly. So we can send them very, very exact. Um, so they, they did find before with the original document, they were able to go through it without any training or handbook? No, we were there to train them personally. You can, yeah, you, it's hard to communicate just with a document of step-by-step -step instructions, even though they're really well drafted, because they still have questions on, they, it's really about understanding the why of things. But now that they understand the why of things, like why it has to be sealed at a certain time, now it's a matter of just saying, instead of mounting the barrel on the bricks, Instead, make a hole, insert bricks, and put the barrel on top. Okay. My expectation is that it's going to be more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it seems, sorry. It seems like, how do you, if you're going to plug the hole with a, with a third brick, mm -hmm. how do you get the brick there? Well, I mean, that, that, does that inevitably involve your hand a half an inch away from the barrel? Sure. So there, you can make other contraptions that we've considered, like a reach, sort of like the things that you used to reach really far away and just grab it and put it there. But um, the simplest design is that, you know, when, I'll show you the picture. When you can walk right next to the barrel, um, you can sort of stand right here and you're not feeling any heat. So you can, if you just drop it in the brick, you're technically not feeling any heat over you. Whereas even with the sheet metal design, you're directly in front of the channel that does have the heat coming out of it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah I'm just surprised that you're getting so much heat out of the channel as opposed to just bringing it out of the side of the barrel. Comparatively. I, I think a lot of it is smoke too that Jess is talking about. A lot of smoke comes out of the channel. And comparatively, remember that it was all on bricks before, so all the heat was radiating out of the bottom, and that was going right to their feet, to their ankles and whatnot. And if there's no, if it's just as easy for them to bring nine bricks as six bricks, then the, you know the easiest way to tell them how wide the hole should be is that it should be a brick wide, yeah. right? And just you measure it with the bricks you're about to use to plug it. But if you can't get there to put the brick in, then that hole efficiency is not working. Right. So that's why, for the time being, we still prefer the solution with the metal seal. So, Jess, you you tested with the hot barrel putting the bricks in. Not with the hot barrel, no. No, we've time tested that. Okay, because yeah. I, I question that you wouldn't ex be exposed to heat by right. putting a brick in. In our video, um, I was significantly close with the sheet metal, and um, 
and I had to be over the over the channel so I can only imagine that being on the side of it where the smoke isn't rising would be better. But that is actually what we're going to be testing on Monday, which is we're going to have two, um, we're going to do two barrels and we're going to be testing the thermometer readings like along the different points around the barrel at different distances. Are you converging no, to No, we'll one? be testing where it's hottest. So if there is a really significant difference between right above the, right above the channel and here, then we know that this is like a safer area or a better area for them to work with. There's a like high resolution thermometer that we're borrowing from two six seven one, <laughs> and uh, from Pablo Lardo and uh, Wait, is it one of the like the infrared gun thermometers. No, or no, it's just like ambient temperature. Yeah. So is that measuring air temperature or sensitive temperature on skin or surface? No, not on skin or surface. Just like you can just air hold it. So air temperature, like ambient so it's temperature. It's I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it, but that's what the description says. There's a surface one that depends on like the surface, the surface roughness, and the surface like change of temperature too, right, in the material. But this one is just supposed to be able to hold it up. Yeah, I mean, if you have something metallic and you have a source most likely radiating to it, you're yeah. not going to measure any heat off of that. The emittance of the metal is going to be so low, or the absorbance of the thermal bubble is going to be so low. So, hmm. um, when you say you have smoke coming out of it, just to kind of continue, um, so smoke's coming out of the channels at the bottom. Right. So, is that happening the entire time, or only after you seal the top? Only after you seal the top. Is there any reason you can't seal the bottom first and then seal the top? Uh, the top is just more of a like. There's actually fire coming out of it, and if the wind changes direction really quickly, then if you're standing close to the barrel, it could actually be pretty close to the flames. So the way, um, the way it's, uh, the way the barrel is sealed now is with the top first, and then kicking out the bricks afterwards. So we've just stuck with that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you don't want this thing going wiggling back and forth when the top is open because maybe some embers can come flying out or something like that. But if you're not wiggling a barrel, uh, maybe you can just seal the bottom first and smoke won't billow out of the bottom and then you can seal the top. Yeah. Yeah. I think because like smoke is still coming out at like kind of like eye level when when the top is open. So our intuition tells us to seal the top first before we. Well, trying. maybe that's another Sensitive. experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So that's more well experiment. Yeah, and the point about, you know, measuring heat is complicated. And so you, because it's, it's coming at you in two different ways, and your measurement devices might only measure one or the other of those ways. And you might want to try a bunch of different ways. I mean, it's because what you're going to be getting is radiant heat. Mm -hmm. As, as bogus as this sounds, you might actually get a more useful measurement by like, you know, to, you know, you, feel? yeah, well, either how hot does it feel or like, you know, if you want to get some kind of integrated measurement, you know, you buy like, you know, three cantaloupes because those at least look like human beings and will absorb radiated heat about the same way where you put them around the thing and then measure how hot they get 15 minutes later. You know, you've got to do, you know, something, but you need an absorber that looks like a, a person, looks okay. like skin. Um, because, like, you know, it's the metal's going to reflect all the all the radiant heat. Sure. So the thermocouple will see it. So another way to do that is to just wrap half or a third of the barrel vertically in tin foil and use some sort of uh, metallic wire to strap a tin, tin foil to like one third of the barrel or half the barrel. Sure. And that will act as a huge radiation shield. So if you want to, that would just tell you if you're, if the heat is coming from hot air coming out from the bottom or from radiation off the barrel. And then you would know actually what your problem is. Sure. So that would be a good test. Any other comments, especially on the sheet metal seal and whatnot? I just wouldn't bank on the women being able to do a test early next week as part of your critical path. Sure. Um, Lindsay did already say that they wanted to do a burn. That's why we are not counting on it, but yeah, it yeah, happen, but yeah, yeah right. absolutely. But I think you should tr try to make that happen. But also, if it takes them a week to make it happen, right. be able to work Continue. with that too. Yeah. One thing I noticed when you were showing the video of you sliding the covers on uh, over next to Kresge, yeah. it looked like it would be useful to have to have a way to pick up the front of the sheet mm -hmm. with with a simple stick. And so I think you could do that simply by putting sorry, putting another block in the back. So you have another lever point 
So you can push the stick in here and effectively pick it up like that. Mm -hmm. Slide it over the bricks because it looks like it's a little yeah. tough slide over the grass. That's a good idea. Yeah. That would need to be as far back or the back edge. Yeah, one of our designs actually after this experiment was um, to sort of like make a, a hole insert where you could put in the, the hole, the yeah, wood, good. but it was mostly for like more yeah. leverage content. Yeah, and then on the flip side, trying to minimize how much metal is used yeah. is also important because yeah. it's expensive. So in the design that Jessica just referenced, uh, you take your sheet and it would have to be thinner than this, mm -hmm. and then you could cut it like here and then there and leave a certain point there mm -hmm. and just bend those two um, edges together and just yeah. fold them. Yeah, and but and I also wonder like if the bricks are decently sealed against the um, grass, if you could make your devices significantly smaller to just cover the hole and not the whole area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do you end up putting sand all the way around the edge of the barrel? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I can't forward to it, but if you op if you exit out of PowerPoint, you might be able to load it in QuickTime or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's totally like you don't want to be rocking the barrel. But we don't, we don't, like they, they did a different order than we do in the video. So we normally just put the lid on top, but then we drop it down before we put the sand so you don't have sand falling off when you're rocking it. Um, so you don't, mm -hmm. Like I, that's why I said like they should try it because you don't have to put the lid on top first. Just to show them. Oh, the ceiling. Yeah, he asked for what the final thing looked like. Right. And what happened here was that the grass um, is a lot fluffier here than in Nicaragua. Like over there, it's kind of burnt out, kind of dry, kind of just not that much grass. Um, and so we know that like there won't be that much like air holes through the grass that we'll have to seal sand all the way around excessively like that. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts or? How much harder is the light than the We didn't think it was really experimentation it didn't like you can still have uh, like strands of the biomass come out through the channels and then just light them right there and in fact it may even be easier because there's no wind passing through yeah. um, so it wasn't it didn't take us that long it's probably either the same or easier than the current method on, on Emilio's clock it was 14 seconds which is more or less what it took us with other Great, okay. thank you. Thanks. So, hello everyone, we're a group of Phoenix. Well, we're the other part of a group of Phoenix. We all traveled together, we sprinted two projects. Um, I'm Juan. We're pretty awesome. We have electricity too. Um, cool. So, I'm Juan. I'm Liz. I'm Sid. Um, and our and our mentors are Amelia and Steve. Um, so I'll just start with. Um, currently, we're working with uh, the cooperative in Savannah Grande that makes the so they make solar cells, they make solar panels, and for the use them for home power and also for as individual cell phone chargers. Currently, this is, these are the large solar panels that they make. They're 60 watts. Um, the, you can see each solar cell is like is com is donated. And all the solar cells that are used are donated, and they're about about 500 cells per box. Well, they do have to be bought though. They're about a yeah. dollar. Yeah. Oh, per sorry. They're bought, but they're bought for a lot for a lower price because they're um, rejects. They're rejects from the factory here in the U.S. The problem is that they're really fragile, and a lot of them break on the shipping there. And so, right now, they're also making, um, sorry, so right now they're also making solar cell phone chargers, but to make the solar cell phone chargers, they need to cut each individual cell so they can get a really high, so they can get a high enough voltage, but still have a small enough solar panel 
that it's uh, transportable. Um, yeah, so this is just uh, well, this is the la landscape of the, the place where we are. We can see there is no grid in a lot of the houses, but a lot of people still have cell phones. And so some of them have to walk up to two or three kilometers to charge their cell phones. And they pay 10 cordos, which is about 50 cents per charge. Um, so that is where that is how we want to, I guess, help the project. This is an example of a Chinese-made cell phone charger that they they have used. Um, as you can see, it it charges and it comes with an um, an extra battery and it charges the extra battery in that device. But this only fits uh, one only fits Nokia cell phones and two is it just imported, so this is not we don't think it's really helping the I guess the the job market in the area. And it costs and, $20. Oh, it also costs $20. <laughs> so, so our goal is to make, so this is why I guess we're, this is why we want to make a cell phone charger. So we want to make one that is, um, can hopefully compete with this, um, not obviously in, like initial manufacturing costs, but at least in like end costs to their own manufacturing costs. Can reduce their time. Currently, it takes them 24 hours to make uh, the small cell phone chargers. And it can also, um, so time, and it can also be, transportable and charge their cell phones and charge all the different types of cell phones that they have. Okay, so um, as Quan said, uh, basically uh, the solar cells uh, output uh, 0.5 volts each and this is your original cell. Uh, the way they do it right now is uh, that they cut up these cells uh, into four parts across like that and then connect them in series so you can step up your voltage. Uh, unfortunately, what ends up happening is when you're cutting these cells, as one mentioned, they're very fragile, so you end up wasting a lot of your cells, and that actually is the largest, like they spend the most amount of their money uh, in cutting the cells and then using the silicone, but we'll get into that later. Um, so we decided that it would be helpful if they could just use the original cells instead of cutting them. And so we thought that if they just connected three of these cells in series, you could go up to 1.5 volts, which is about like a normal pencil cell. And then we thought we would just step up that voltage to 5 volts, which is what a uh, cell phone charger uses. Um, to do that, we bought, so this is the circuitry that we're using. Um, so essentially, like a lot of, I mean, we couldn't actually make the step up. Uh, we tried, but we failed. Uh, so we decided to just buy it like off the shelf. And so this is how our breadboard looks. Um, essentially, this would be your input right here. Uh, and this would be 1.5 uh, DC input. And then you'd have a 5 volt DC output coming in from here. Um, and basically, your solar cells would uh, be connected. <coughs> so your so solar cells are here. And this little thing fits into this depression right here. And then, so your panels are connected in series. You have two wires connecting to these terminals. It steps up to 5 volts and goes out to connect to this thing. This thing then goes into your Nokia slash whatever phone you have and then charges your phone. Um, is the video yeah, the next for this? One. Uh, make sure my volume's on, though. Uh. Yeah, so we kind of like made a video. All right. Okay, so we're switching on the light. So, so three sol cells right here. And now we're going to measure the voltage by the solar cells. So 1.6 volts, that's good. We're now we're going to measure the voltage after we step up. Can you guys hear that that's at all? Or is it? So that's good. Okay. Now Juan's going to plug in the cell phone. Okay. And it says charging. <laughs> Which is the voltage and across the battery, so it makes sense that when it's plugged in, it's 3.8 volts instead of 5. And the, yeah, so that's basically like the works like. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much. Like. Yeah, and then we've also been talking to the community. Um, if I'm at, we're hoping we can talk to them on the phone soon. This week they haven't really been in contact because it's Holy Week. Um, but we sent them this in Spanish and some other instructions about kind of what we've been working on so we can hope to get their feedback. Um, we, like this is our kind of looks like model. You saw how Sid kind of can put the stuff into this indentation here. 
um, so that when it's not in use or when it's you know noon, it can be completely flat. This also protects all of the um, the circuitry from the uh, like rain and that kind of thing. Um, there could be notches added to the sides so that, for instance, you could make it lower by you know lowering these, and it could be like that and stay still. Um, and it's also just something they can really simply make. They also make other things with wood in the same center, so they have all the materials. Um, it's pretty low cost, and you can add, you know, we have a hole here for security, you can see in the picture, um, so that if they want to kind of like tie it up and lock it to something while it's charging, they can do that. Um, it's pretty portable, but it's also like not so small that someone can just stick it in their pocket and run away with it. Um, it's adjustable and just easy for them to make. So we're hoping that they like it. They can easily change the looks like design as well. Um, most of how we're trying to help them is the acts like because they're pretty capable of coming up with things like this themselves. But this is just kind of our suggestion. Um, we've also been talking with some other people who are working on the other aspects of the solar panels, like the like trying to make the uh, application of the glass on top easier and things like that. So other people have that part covered. So we're focusing a lot on just making it actually be able to charge a cell phone. And what we're looking to do next is, um, like right now it's on the breadboard and it's definitely like if you handed this to a customer and we're like, don't break it, like something's gonna come out and then they won't know what to do with it. So we have to make it more kind of uh, able to be actually given to somebody and not break. Uh, so more durable, I guess. Uh, we need to be able to make it easy to explain so that because we might not have anybody down there showing them, they, they can still learn how to do it. They have a mechanic, uh, or, I mean, an, an engineer who's been trained and should know how to put this together reasonably well, and he's definitely better at soldering than we are. So it should be doable. Thank you. Yeah, and like to be clear, like this is, uh, this is just a model of, this is actually going to be a solar panel. Like yeah. this is not wood, in case people were kind of confused. <laughs> this is, we, this is a, the solar panel, but since our project focuses on like converting the voltage to a cell phone charging voltage, we decided to just like go with this just to show you guys how it's going to look uh, when the solar panel is in fact installed. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, three, three, uncut, three, so. three uncut. Yeah. yeah. Pre yeah, yeah, pretty basically. much. Yeah. What's the cost of your circuitry? You said you had enough money. Um, so, so we estimate. So, like, uh, the we, right now we bought five of each. If you buy like large scale, uh, like sorry, like wholesale. Uh, I think this I think this thing should cost about $4, yeah. like this entire It cost us like thing. $6. This, this is about 6 for us, but I think it should cost 4 Uh, and then, so the connectors are actually more expensive, um, uh, but that's because, so there are two ways to do it. Either you buy the whole thing, cut it off, but that doesn't make any sense, right? So I look, when we looked it up, uh, online, you can buy like about 10 of them for $7, um, but there are probably cheaper ways to buy them. Uh, maybe if we contacted the company, asked them about it, I, I, we, we're still deciding uh, how to get them for cheap. But we can definitely, I think this should be about a dollar max, like if you just buy it. So. And then when you add in their, um, like the time they'll use, like it probably will take them about eight hours now because they won't have to cut cells. So uh, that'll, you know, add another four dollars or something because they like getting paid about 50 cents an hour, I think. So it'll definitely be able to compete with the current one. Problem. Yeah. Are there any questions? Are you sorry? I'm sorry, yeah, you catch that. So um so basically the the concept, the, like the reason we decided to put in the depression underneath was that like uh, if it did rain, it wouldn't be immediately affected. Uh, that being said, like this isn't going to protect it against, like, if you like leave it out in the rain, it's not going to protect it. So uh, I guess the concept is that you leave it out only when it's bright. But if it suddenly starts to rain, it'll give you a certain amount of protection against it before you can, you know, take it back in. And the solar cells themselves, uh, to be clear, are not going to be just like bare oh, the way yeah. we, we had them. This is a panel. The, like, the, they'll still do the process of with, with like, a silicone so and glass on top, um, because that's necessary. You can't, I mean, the cells get damaged if you don't 
uh, encapsulate them. Right. I mean, just to be clear, just so we, I realized we didn't explain like how the panel looks. Uh, the way the panel looks is that like you have uh, the three solar cells in series, which are then encapsulated in silicone. Uh, you have an aluminum frame. Yeah. Sorry. So you have like an aluminum frame. You have these cells in series, uh, and they're encapsulated by silicone. Uh, you then uh, pressure. You put pressure on a glass frame on top of it and leave it to, like set. Uh, and then you have like a plastic sheet underneath. So this is basically waterproof. Uh, and this is what we're talking about will be here. Because these are the kinds of panels that they stick on their roofs and right. they use for power. Except so. like in our case, you'd have only three cells as opposed to... Yeah, so it's a lot less cells. time. A lot of the problems with the big ones is when you uh, encapsulate it, you have to push it down and make sure that there's no air bubbles. And it's really hard on a big panel to make sure there's no bubbles. But on the smaller ones, it's mostly the cutting that they said they're, they really need to get rid of. So that's what our goal was. Yeah, I mean, the goal basically, like Liz said, is to eliminate cutting the cells because that's a pain. It's a pain and they break. Uh, they said, like, you know, if they have five cells, they'll break three of them. Or, yeah. Like, and so they won't break these because they're just full cells. Right. But have you tried in lab pointing that halogen light at the solar cell and actually fully charging the phone? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, no. like, yes, we, we the yeah. efficiency on that is so horrifying as yeah. to be. I mean, it's like yeah, it's point oh one percent. I mean, it's like ten amps, fifteen amps at one hundred and twenty volts to get like a milliwatt into the phone, which is crazy. But you should try it. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. we actually got like the video we showed you was yesterday, so uh, we're probably gonna try that over the weekend. Yeah. 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 yeah, you should just set it, I mean, find a phone that will actually give you like a, some kind of decent readout of how charged it is right. yeah. and run it for, you know, half an hour and see how see how much the charge yeah. improves right. over a half an hour yeah. or, or yeah. take out the battery measure the voltage on the cell at a couple different times or something. Yeah. Definitely. We did a rough calculation based on it. It should have about 100 milliamp uh, current and like how long that should take and it'll be longer than the China one. The China one's about five hours and this hopefully will be like seven or eight hours, but we have not tested this, so that could be a big problem. We have to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you may just find that you need to have storage in your thing. If there's not enough, if there's yeah. not enough current coming out of that thing to charge in real time, you may have to add a battery to that so yeah. that you can yeah. store a little bit and then charge your phone as well. Storage. And we have also been testing uh, the voltage necessary to actually get enough right. voltage to, put to like, so we can get enough voltage that it can be stepped up to five volts. And right now we're getting that is 1.2 volts is the minimum. According to the circuit, we should be able we should be able to step up to 5 volts using only 0.7 volts. So we're yeah. going to keep trying that. But, but it also shouldn't be much of a problem because in Nicaragua and Sun, like, it is a volt and a half. Like, it would have to be, like, sunset for it to be that low and who's charging their solar cell phone at that hour, really. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, so we're definitely going to try that, though, just try and charge the cell phone. Uh, part of our initial plan was actually to have a separate uh, energy uh, storage device, like, in our system, but uh, we decided that that would, like, increase costs. Uh, and so we thought that if we could do it without that, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, that's it always a possibility, testing. though. Yeah. Any feedback from Mauro or others at Group of we Phoenix yet? Yeah. We really need to talk to them. Like they, they're not very good at getting back to us. Okay. So I would encourage you to use the phone next yeah. week. Yeah. We, we want to talk to them. Next call week. them. So yeah. we have a lot of questions. That a conversation will be really helpful. Yeah. So, so how many non-Nokia phones did you see when you were there? Um, we only actually saw two kinds of cell phones. We saw Nokia and a ZTE phone. And a ZTE e phone um, can be charged in a similar way. It's, it, it's the same voltage input. Um, yeah, it's a different connector. Um, we could also do this with a USB charger, but the Nokia phone does, can't be charged via USB, so we just use that. Um, we're waiting. Lindsay, the woman who's the like liaison that the other group was talking about, said that she has like a, a spreadsheet with what kind of cell phones everyone has, but we're trying to get that from her. Right. Um, but we asked a lot of people, and those are the only two cell phones we found. Right. So I mean, right now these are the two connectors we have. This one charges yeah. a Nokia, and then this one's a USB charger. So. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. As we speak, we're actually going to pass around the little Ziploc bags of the experiments we did with the rice. 
And um, the NGO that we worked with was called ASA PROSAR, and we are actually part of the class that went to El Salvador and not Nicaragua. Um, we worked in a community called La Magdalena in El Salvador, and the NGO is currently introducing rice cultivation in the community, um, both to be used as a source of income and also as nutrition. And in order for um, the rice to be ready for consumption, uh, it needs to be processed, and the process involves uh, threshing and dehusking. And current methods of dehusking are very um, time and money intensive. They usually involve a two to three hour bus ride to a mill um, where the rice can be processed. And um, it costs about three to four dollars, we found out, which is uh, about um, a daily salary. So our design challenge is to develop a method that's um, for more local, faster, and cheaper way of dehusking rice. Um, the two most important project specifications uh, that we focused on were the efficiency, which refers to the amount of rice that's successfully dehusked, and also how gentle the uh, process is, meaning um, we wanted to minimize the amount of rice that's broken or cut in half. And some of the other specifications we looked at were safety, affordability, of course, um, durability, um, and also um, aesthetics. Um, we approached the problem by brainstorming. Uh, we researched some existing technologies that people use in regions that rice is grown. Some of them are more simple, some of them involve uh, heavy machinery. Uh, what we concluded, though, is that all of these technologies use friction in order to get the husk from the rice. And it's a matter of um, adjusting the amount of friction we have in order to get the husk off, but um, not break the rice grain. And some of the ideas we ran through were a um, pepper grinder, where we have cylinders rotating together, um, rubbing together uh, plates that can be made from different materials, uh, mortar and pestle idea which is used but it's um, a lot more energy intensive and not as efficient, and also the molino which is a, a corn mill that's currently used in El Salvador um, to grain corn, and that's um, basically two circular plates that um, rub together and that's what we actually have over there. Um, so Amy Smith actually had visited this community before we had and she had looked at this molina and um, inserted a black inner tube in between the two metal parts. Um, so we used that kind of as our standard when we were looking at um, how we could go about improving this process. Um, so we used this pew chart um, with these attributes to kind of figure out which one would be the most feasible to do this semester um, and which one would be the most um, efficient for the community to use overall. Um, in the end, we chose to modify the existing molino um, by inserting a different material in between the plates. Right now, we have um, the two leather inserts in there. If, oh, okay. So they kind of, we kind of just add like a circular insert in between them. Um, the advantages of using the molino is that our community partner, Asa Prosar, is actually um, distributing the molinos to the community to use for um, corn to make cornmeal, um, to grind yucca, to and like so it's very multifunctional for them. And although the cost is twenty dollars, as a processor is funding this um, distribution to the communities. Um, and as it is now, either one family will use it or a whole community will use it. So it's available to a lot of people. Um, it's pretty durable. The metal is pretty rigid, um, and it's not labor intensive. It's just a hand crank that you use. Um, a few of the challenges with the molino, though is that when you just do it without any insert, it cracks or um, breaks the rice, so people don't really necessarily want broken rice. Um, and it wears the material down. If you put something in there, we kind of need a durable material that will withstand this turning. Um, so we decided upon five different materials that we wanted to test. Um, and we looked at leather, rubber, metal, wood, and fabric. Um, and Based on those, we looked at the cost, residue, durability, and availability of those. Um, we brought back leather and rubber from El Salvador, um, so we actually could use stuff that was avail available in those communities. And Missy will talk to you about what we found. So we did uh, quite a few experiments where the main variables that we were really testing were what type of material that we wanted to use, and then also how many turns of the Molino that we were going to do. 
Um, so first to just highlight the um, main steps of the experiments that we did. First we inserted the material and then in order to be able to accurately measure how much space there actually existed in between the uh, sides of the Molino and the um, insert, we tightened it as far as we could once we uh, inserted the material and then we measured it from the number of turns out. So uh, how much we actually loosened it from the most tight position. And then we used the same amount of rice for each experiment, 50 grams, and we ran it through. And once we had gone through the Molino, we uh, sifted it through to get rid of the really crushed pieces. And then we winnowed it, so essentially just uh, tossing the rice up uh, so the air will catch and blow the husks away so you can get rid of the husks. and then. We separated the rice into four main components, being the rice that was still husk, the rice that was whole, the rice that was crushed uh, or broken, and then also if there were any husks left as well. And then we noted, um, and you'll see the bags themselves are labeled as they're going passing around um, how many turns that it took, and then uh, the number, the weight of the still husked rice, the, the weight of the husked rice, and if it was in pieces such. So this is a, we won't like this picture, is a picture of the rice that has, is still husked, a whole uh, grain of hus dehusked rice, a broken grain, and then some of the particles that we used to sift through to get rid of. And so one of the experiments we used with the honeycomb rubber is what we called it. Uh, that's, oh, picture is kind of self-explanatory what we called that. But um, so we, we did a couple experiments with this and you can see in the pictures that we have uh, whether the, it's kind of hard to see from these pictures, but um, once we've separated it through what, how much of the rice is still husk, how much of the rice it has been dehusked based on the number of turns. What we noted about the rubber though is that we weren't very sure how hazardous the residue that might end up on the rice would be because it's not an organic material. Uh, we also noted that this rubber costs about $6 per square foot, so it's not too expensive. Um, another, we decided to flip that rubber around and decided to test with the different textures. And uh, the same thing happens with this rubber. Again, it's not organic. So we, we did a quick little data sheet uh, based on the number of turns and the mass we started with and then the mass that was broken and just to get an idea. Um, then we continued on with leather which was the kind, um, since it's organic and a little bit cheaper than the rubber, made us feel a little bit better as the one we kind of preferred uh, and it's very readily tested um, but we were trying to decide how many layers of the leather we should um, put. So. So as we did the experiments with the leather, sometimes we processed it through twice, sometimes we did different number of turns with different layers, and you can see most of them are relatively the same, some are a little bit better, um, but ultimately we decided, um, well, we decided that the material wasn't the biggest part, but we still decided to test with uh, duct tape, which we found unfortunately wore away relatively quickly. And then we tried for the heck of it a flat sheet metal surface, and essentially that was a disaster. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to Benji. Um, so the so one of the reasons that we decided to go against the flat metal was because the rice wasn't actually fed into the molino um, the way that the plate the way that the back plate is designed and shaped, the, it feeds in the rice. And so we decided to just focus on the one side of, um, on the back side of the molino and just adding the material there. Um, so as you can see, like we have a lot of the tests and um, we did a lot of tests, but actually there was no conclusive, like awesome material that was way better at husking the rice than the others. Um, and so basically we said, okay, well the, the we noticed that the most important variable for deciding that was the number of turns away from, you know, from tightening it. And so we said, well, you know, we still have to decide on a material. So we wanted to um, optimize how much how much rice was broken, um, and also just think about uh, the robustness and the availability of the material. Um, and so we decided on choosing leather um, because of its availability and because of um, because it is organic. It's much safer. Um, 
And so going, we did a couple more uh, uh, exploratory tests with the leather um, and trying to decide how soft we wanted to make the leather effectively, like how it interacts with the rice. And so we tried with two pieces of leather um, glued together and then three pieces together. And um, unsurprisingly, we actually found that they were very similar as well. Um, so, you know, so we decided on going with two pieces of leather rather than the three because it's just it's less material, it's less expensive. Um, and so going forward, we're going to be optimizing that sort of two-layer uh, process, um, or you know how we're going to be gluing those together. You know what type of glue, um, or if we're going to sew them together because the glue might not be available. Um, and so we'll be looking at those sort of details of um, of that leather material. Um, but also we wanted to look at the process of how it's being uh, how it's being put through the mill. Um, so not only changing the material, but also thinking, well, if we change the number of turns to, you know, say, three times more than usual, and then going through it twice, you know, does that change the results at all? Like, is it more gentle with, um, with the rice if you process through it twice while husking more of the material? Um, so we'll be looking at that, or if we can do anything to the rice prior to actually running it through the mill that would make it more effective um, for dehusking it. Um, so that's about it. If you guys have any questions, we can also show how this is working so far, too. <laughs> One reason was for explaining it to community partners, it's a lot easier to say six turns from as tight as you can tighten it, as opposed to three millimeters in between, because we don't want to use exact measurements with that, and also kind of gave us, um, using different materials, gave us a lot of flexibility with how much we have in between, so we can kind of give a standard program. amount of rice to, to be in there. See, like we did, but just from the little bit that has come out already, there's a lot of broken pieces. So like with with this setup, we found it at like four, five, six turns. Uh, just because we found that like having the rice not actually dehusked. Oh, it's getting into um, this. But we'd rather have rice oh. de not dehusked as opposed to like a lot of broken pieces. Um, I'm not sure if you guys also saw the bag that was just it broken. So basically, it still husks. It still husks it without this material, but um, it's actually much more effective than this. From a shoe place, right? Do you know how they made it? Because yeah, leather tanning. I mean, that leather could be the most toxic thing you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Conceivably, I mean, like one of the things that is used in leather tanning is like chromium sulfate as the tanning agent. So, like, it's just worth finding out. I mean, the uh, another option is tannin, which comes from oak trees. I'm guessing we have a lot of oak trees in El Salvador, but um, yeah, it's worth finding out. Because it would be sad to poison everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get invited back after. Well, they can't invite you back if they're all dead. We've been also we've been um, we've been waiting for them to respond to um, the questions, but some of the questions um, that we've been trying to get answers to are like how many how many people may need the how many people can use it? Would it be a family or a whole community? And how much rice do they consume? How much rice can they grow? And I think that's gonna it's gonna be important for us to know in terms of the material and how durable the material is. And does every does each family have a, um, a piece of this leather, or is it permanently attached to the mill? And so there's a lot of questions that we're still. Yeah. I just wouldn't take for granted what is and isn't toxic, you know, right. based on like because yeah. the rubber could be yeah. fine for all yeah. we know, and the leather could be yeah, you know, not sure. poisonous. Sure. Um, and it, and if what comes off is stuff that you can wash off, then it's not the end of the world. 
Well, the problem with the inner tube was that it was leaving like a black residue on there. Right, right, yeah. So if, it, if it's like marking like, with a crayon like on each one, on yeah. But anything. if there's like, you know, a little bit of rubber dust that comes off but it's not adhering to anything, mm -hmm. you can wash it off and it might. Your yellow rubber. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's just worth exper you know actually finding out what the what chemicals are actually present because it might it's be that you could eat you know a loaf of that rubber and you'd be fine, but right. if you chew on the leather for a little bit and get sick. It's just hard to control that, you know what I mean? Like the shops will be doing their different. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think I think it's worth figuring out. Like yeah. worst case scenario, this leather is tanned with right. whatever chemicals Steve just mentioned. Right. Is that something that's going to get absorbed into the rice or something that's going to be washed off during processing? Mm -hmm. If it's going to get absorbed, maybe we need to knock this leather out as a contender sure. and find something similar because it seemed like different materials all seem to work basically the same. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, would an old t-shirt work just as well or something? I don't know. How um, would fabric work? Did you try yeah, so with that's the reason we did the, the duct tape was like not as an actual sort of design, but just to see how long it lasts because it is like generally Resistant. But it does wear in. Like the, we tried really this um, foam material, and that it j like you can see that. Yeah, with yeah. 50 After grams, with the 50, times. with even running like this much of 50 grams with the duct tape, you could tell that it was worn. And like we actually do tests with um, between the denim and leather, like yeah. for motorcycles, and like they simulate someone falling down, and like the leather lasts for 90 feet of dragging, while denim lasts for five. Wow. So and denim is like very durable, right? Like. But the inside, I don't know if Benji showed you, but the inside of these, um, can you, can you, can you? Oh yeah, I mean, it's like you're trying to grind, grind sandpaper. Yeah, it's so it's gonna wreck like whatever you put right. in. Both sides are rich, so. There's a reason why that thing's made out of metal. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we were looking at doing flat metal, um, so that that was more durable, but, you know, like I mentioned, we need the, we need the design on the inner part, yeah. um, to, to pull the right out, otherwise it's just like two pieces. Yeah. And so even if you made the, the inner hole, uh, the, the metal piece that goes on this side, did you make the inner hole big enough so that um, the rice could come out through? Yeah, so, you, so it needs the like, the, this it the cutting in, yeah, enough. the dimension, like it can't actually just be a flat surface no matter how big the hole is huh. because the rice isn't allowed to like feed into it. These ridges like wear the material down a lot. It's on both sides of this. Have you found, I, I, I didn't go look, I was too busy looking up how you tan leather while you were talking, but the, <laughs> um, but there are, all over YouTube, there are videos of like how manufacturing processes happen. Usually they're put up by the people who build the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and it'd be I'm curious how they actually, like how rice actually gets husked. Yeah, so they do you know, it, they do it with like rollers basically, like rubber rollers a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, which is, it's a totally different geometry that we're yeah, dealing yeah. with. Um, but yeah. like Pula said, it's like the friction. Yeah, and I just wonder if there's pieces of that you can steal. Yeah. There's, you know, like like if that's too coarse, but a flat plate with a single slot cut in it mm. would get you, you know, would, you know, mm. like if you had if you had grooves cut in it that happened to be about the right size for a grain of rice or something, mm. um, it, would, it would help you out, but I don't, I don't know. I'm just wondering if there are tricks. This might be too far out, but what about like a tumbling? process instead of a grinding process. Yeah, the um, the marine there's a, a team also doing moringa seed husking in D lab design I believe. Um, but moringa is actually very soft and it doesn't end up getting damaged by the tumblers. Whereas the hus the husks are actually pretty soft and the rice is hard. So if there were tumblers the like just from looking at it the rice would probably get more crushed whereas the husks probably wouldn't really as much. Um, we found that the soft materials really like give and allow the husk to come off with yeah. the friction, but not damage the rice as much. So right. we try to push for softer as opposed to kind of like that hitting. Right. What's wrong with broken rice? That's something that we Sell actually uh, that we wanted to ask the community. Um, I gotta get mushy. You'd probably get too mushy. Yeah. Regular. Well, part of the reason they they want to use like this as a tool in their community is they want to sell rice too. So I would assume we haven't. I'm in contact really with our community partner. We haven't gotten back to us, but um, we'd assume that they'd want to sell whole grains as opposed to. One question I think I mentioned this last time I saw you guys. One question you might want to ask is um, what their expectations are for broken yeah. rice. If they already, from the mill, if they get 25% broken rice already and they just break it back to. Yeah, so I would get on the phone yeah. next week. Yeah. Yeah. 
hopefully we can reach them. Um, if you end, whatever material you end up with, whether it's leather or something else, uh, figuring out just how long it does last, so how many grams you can process before you need to replace it, and then getting like a both both for your users so that they know we should be replacing it this often, and also so you can get a cost estimate for like we're gonna in a year you know or this many tons of rice we're gonna need this much leather or whatever it is and it'll be useful. Did you bring the rice back from El Salvador? No. Or is it from like a farm nearby where the rice comes from? It is from, it's a from farm Arkansas. in Texas. <laughs> but I mean, from comparison, they are very similar. Well, nobody's going to let you bring a sack of unhusked rice yeah. back from Arkansas. <laughs> I mean, if you did, you did it hidden in a vault up sock. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>